live. I'm live on Facebook. I don't know what Instagram's doing. Hi, everybody on Facebook. Um, yeah, it just made a circle. You know what? Hi, people on Facebook. How you doing? Still trying to get the whole different, different social media platforms all going at the same time. Okay, here we go. Ah, ha, ha. Now I will be there. Yay! Thank you. Hi, everybody. We're live on Facebook, live on Instagram, and so happy to be here in the gathering room with you guys. Hi, just a mess just joined. <laughs> Guess what? Just a mess. You are actually probably my alter ego. And so there really is only one of us. That's really, that's <clears throat> a deep metaphysical issue right there. Hi, everybody. Ro, of course she's here. Dr. Donna is here. A bunch of other people are here. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, it's funny. No people on Facebook, just on Instagram. That's okay. So today is a day when we are going to be talking about transitions. So I'm going to wait just another minute and talk about how things go when our lives are shifting and changing. Hi, Coral Newberry. Hello, Buddha fell. Oh, yeah, you are awesome. Um, yeah, okay. For some reason, it's not showing any numbers, Rose, so I'm going to... Okay, there's a lot of people. That's all I needed to know. How is everybody? I hope you're... Uh, I hope you're in the middle of a really wonderful transition. Because as you know, I have this obsession with enlightenment with awakening, with the transformation of consciousness. And I have read thousands of books about it. And I have talked to many, many, many people all around the world. And one thing I know is that we grow spiritually and we grow psychologically in phases. And I, I talked to you once about the way babies grow. They, they don't grow at all in length for like weeks on end. And then suddenly in one day, they'll grow like half an inch longer. And then the next day they'll grow half an inch again. Can you imagine if you got up two days from now and you were an inch taller? That's how babies actually grow. But then they just are stuck again for like three, four weeks and then boom. So I was talking a long time ago about how this seems to be characteristic of many things in nature, that they build momentum. I mean, a quantum leap is literally when um, a molecule or an atom is getting to be to hold so much energy that it can't sustain its identity and it boom goes to a different it becomes a different um a different substance a literal different substance so it gathers energy and then boom it gets bigger babies gather energy boom they get bigger and we do this intellectually we do it you may have had this experience learning a language where you're oh you're trying so hard and then one day boom you get a lot more information. I remember doing this when I learned to ski. I learned to ski a little bit when I was like 12, but it was it was a debacle. I'll tell you that right now. I was like using somebody else's used skis and they didn't fit me. And I didn't have ski clothes. I had this beaver fur hat with ear flaps. It was a terrible, terrible experience. And I can't even believe you would bring it up between us. P PTSD moment. Anyway, then I went in my 40s. Somebody asked me to go skiing and I was like, no, I hate skiing. And then they put rented equipment that had changed so drastically since I first learned that the things practically skied themselves and I was hooked. So here I am like 42 beginning skiing with all these little kids whizzing past me. But I loved it. So I learned okay. And I would practice during the off season. And then um, I could not do moguls, those bumps in the in the snow when people ski a hill it gets these bumps carved out and they're terrifying they don't look terrifying from the lift they don't look terrifying on tv but when you're in them it is like every single one is a Thelma and louise cliff that is going to jettison you into oblivion they are freaking terrifying and when you get stuck on them you don't just fall down gracefully whoo, on your side like i would on relatively fat, flat terrain no you do what's called a yard sale. And that means that you hit the ground so hard that your goggles fly off, your mittens fly off, your skis are just everywhere. Your ski poles are like seven yards down the hill and they call it a yard sale because it's like you put all your possessions out for people to see. 
So I just avoided um, bumps, but I kept getting a little bit better on flat. I kept getting a little better and a little better and a little better. And then I would try the moguls. Couldn't do it. So I finally hired an instructor and he said, watch me and watch exactly where I go on the bump before I turn and then do exactly what I do. So I did. I would go right behind him and he found this place where there were only two bumps. <laughs> and he showed me on these two bumps over and over how to do exactly how to turn. <clears throat> and then I was like, oh, my God, I know the secret. I am a much better skier. Boom. So then I went to a moderately bumpy hill. And you know what I did? I skied that. I skied it. I was like, foom, foom, foom. I felt great. Didn't look awful, I thought. Maybe. Not to myself. So then I was like, now I can ski bumps. So I went up again and I went down the same hill. And you guys, I nearly lost my life. I lost control on those moguls so hard that I got thrown off the side of the mountain into a river. Actually, it wasn't so much a river as a stream, but it had a spot in the middle. It was iced in, except there was a spot in the middle with no ice, like this wide. And what happened is I was still on my feet skiing over this river and it hit the place where there was no ice and my skis went deep down and then they rebounded Foing! and it literally threw me like 20 feet through the air. It was, it was a religious experience for sure. People thought I was dead, dead, dead. I was, I was happy. I was just a little stunned, but I'm here to say it wasn't, it was not the, the it was not the least embarrassing moment of my life. And it also made me think, well, what the heck? I was making progress. And now this, this is the worst face plan, the worst yard sale I've ever had. Well, here's the deal, you guys. When you're going through one of those foom stages where things are suddenly better, and this can be um, whether you're studying a subject, whether you're in a relationship and you're getting closer to each other, or it can be in your spiritual development when you're like suddenly have this oh my God, this insight into the world where your spirits are soaring and you feel like you'll never be sad again or confused or any of that. Well, I get those sometimes. And then I have a yard sale. And it's because when you're in the phase, of, when you're in the growth period, like when babies are in that growth period, those two days, when they go from being 20 inches long to 21 inches long, they can't tell how big their bodies are, so they become very uncoordinated. They're growing so fast that what was working before doesn't work anymore. They reach out for something, and suddenly their fingers don't respond the same way because they're longer, and they, they try to crawl, and they don't. the body isn't quite the way it was before, so they, they go into tantrum phase. They howl indignantly. You can tell they're not really sad. They're just angry. They're, Sometimes they're sad. Why can I not do things anymore? So during the period of transition, what happens is these moments of mastery occur. And then these moments of total yard sale, worse than you've ever had before. So I, the reason I bring this up, of course, is because it's been happening to me. And really, what else do I ever talk about? So I had, I just, like I had one day this week where something cracked through. And it was the most transcendent day of my life to date like the exquisiteness of the human experience. I was so saturated in it that I thought it was going to explode. Like there was so much happiness and everything seemed so alive. Like I could feel, I've talked before about we're mostly made up of space, but space is alive and sentient and loving. And I felt supercharged. The space inside my cells felt so vibrant. And I thought, this is amazing. I have this mastery. Bam, yard sale. I don't know quite what happened. I think I had a doctor told me my foot was chubby or something. <laughs> my my foot healing is still much chubbier than the other foot. And they say that'll last a while. Anyway, some little weird thing happened and I got spun out. Now, I realized if that had happened to me when I wasn't in a phase of more like delight and joy than I'd ever experienced before, I doubt it would have bothered me much. I would have ridden that thing. Oh, I, I can ski this, no problem. But I was skiing on a really, on a much harder slope. Like I had, I'd gotten this special trick. I don't even know what the trick was. It was something that happened in meditation. And meditation goes like that. You, you sit there quietly for a long time and then suddenly, boom, you get these 
moments when you think, well, that's why I meditate. And then it just goes back to flat beer again. But over time, you get bigger and bigger and bigger. So I wanted to talk today about how to navigate when your life feels like I'm making progress, I'm doing the things, I'm getting healthier, I'm getting wiser, I'm getting you know, calmer and better to be around and I'm mastering my trade or whatever. And then suddenly you have a moment of greatness followed by a yard sale. First of all, I just wanted to point out the pattern because it can be very discouraging when you think you're getting somewhere and you have a terrible failure. The other thing I wanted to tell you was um, I've been reading one of my favorite books. I talked about this last time on The Gathering Room. But it's called The Cloud of Unknowing. And it's by, um, it was written in about 1380 by someone. We don't know what their gender was. We don't know what their name was because they withheld that. But it reads like a very loving letter from a very close friend who happens to speak Middle English about how to know God. That's their particular take on what is the consciousness of, what is our ultimate being? So how to know what our ultimate being is. And the idea is that God cannot be conceptualized. So if you're trying to think your way to a state of enlightenment, it will not work. God cannot be thought. Furthermore, in order to get to the place where the divine can be experienced, you have to stop knowing. And that's why it's called the cloud of unknowing. You're, you're actually aiming for something called the cloud of unknowing. And it's like beginner's mind or don't know mind in Asian traditions. So um, I was reading away and I had forgotten that in the cloud of unknowing, he gives or they give, anonymous gives instructions about how to handle the wobbliness of the practice. And I didn't remember <laughs> this is great. I didn't remember that the first instruction is to build for yourself a cloud of forgetting and climb onto that cloud. That's your foundation, the cloud of forgetting. And I read that and I thought, that is frankly terrifying to most people raised in our culture. Since you were a tiny thing, you have been quizzed and tested and held to account for remembering things. You're supposed to remember things. You remember your passwords, thousands of passwords. You remember everything you ever learn in a classroom. You remember all the important birthdays and, and celebration days for your loved ones. You remember, you remember, you remember. And if you start to forget, that's like the most horrifying thing that could happen, which is why like Alzheimer's is so terrifying to me, to, you, to, to most people, I think, because forgetting, forgetting loved ones, forgetting cherished experiences, what could be worse? It's been really scary for me to have a son who is 33 now, my son with Down syndrome, who's done these amazing things. Like we've had these incredible experiences. And when I bring them up and talk to him about them, he says, ah, I don't remember that. And it's actually scary. They were such profound moments in my life. And I thought they were profound moments for him too. But he's like, nah, I don't remember. And I used to think, oh, Lord, here we go, because uh, Alzheimer's is actually common in people with Down syndrome. And, and he may have early stage Alzheimer's. He may get it later. I don't know. But the fact is, he's never been much for remembering things. But it doesn't bother him. And as I was reading The Cloud of Unknowing, I realized that he says, get into the cloud of forgetting, because until you let go of your past, you can't go into the unknowable. So the first thing you have to do is let go of everything you've known in the past. Let it all go. And I was, after reading this, I took our little daughter Lila outside and it's just coming on fall and the leaves are starting to come down from the trees. And we sat there in the, in the middle of these huge beech trees and they're all murmuring and talking and she's looking around. She's never seen trees turn yellow in her whole life before. And I could see that without any knowledge underneath what she was experiencing, it was so gorgeous. And in that moment, I went back to the place where I'd been in meditation. And it was just like, I forgot that I was supposed to feed her in an hour that um, we have to do things to sign, you know, we have to get her vaccinated someday if they have that, like all this stuff, all the worry about your loved one, it was gone in the wonder of her not knowingness.
we were just sitting there. We just started eating, opening birch pods, <clears throat> which are not edible, but you never really know a thing until you've chewed it a while. That's what you can learn from a one-year-old. And then I thought, okay. So and the cloud of forgetting came up under me like a mattress and I was just there with her. And then, then you look into the future and you bring the cloud of unknowing down so that you don't think into the future. So first, like try it right now, if you can. What if you could just forget everything that's ever happened, everything that's ever gone wrong, everything alarming that anyone's ever told you and we're just here sitting with each other and then drop projection into the future and just feel the cloud of forgetting and the cloud of unknowing as the two loving halves of a spiritual embrace that it's not, you're not in danger in there. You're not vulnerable because you're between forgetting and the unknown. You are tenderly, gently held because you're not thinking anymore. You're not knowing anymore. When you're going through a transition and you're getting banged around a lot, the cloud of forgetting is your mattress and the cloud of unknowing is the big feather quilt you pull over yourself. They're both very soft. And in that gentleness of presence, there is this wonder and awe and safety that we don't associate with not knowing. I just, before I go to questions, I wanted to leave you with, I have a new favorite quote of the week and it's from the cloud of unknowing. And he, it says this, and if you're, whatever you're going through right now, this can be a helpful thing to put on the bathroom mirror. Anonymous says, because God cannot be thought. They say, therefore, I will abandon everything I have ever known to love the one thing I cannot think. I, just, I read that and I just went, this is all I need to do. I don't need to strive for enlightenment. I don't need to deal with the repercussions of my mistakes. I just need to abandon everything I've ever known to love the thing I cannot think. So I hope that takes you, I mean, they Anonymous takes me into that place with the energy of their words. And I hope that by passing along to them along to you, I haven't diluted them too much. Because <clears throat> I think we're in a time when um, a lot of us are going through very, very big transitions and we'll have this, I can do it, face plant yard sale over and over and over again. So let me read some questions. Let's see what y'all are doing. Chris says, I'm in transition and moving toward integrity. Thanks to you. Oh, no, sweetheart. Thanks to you. I am now for the first time attracting all of these things I'm interested in. How do I, how to, Yes. How do I find what most, what I most want to transition and to pick? That's what's so cool about not knowing anything. Because in the absence of knowing, the heart loves what it loves and it moves toward things. Like crawling around with Lila, because ever since my foot surgery, I've found that crawling is a wonderful way to get around. So we're crawling through the, the grass <clears throat> and we see a worm that needs saving. We save the worm. Okay, that was a clear instruction of what to do next. Then what do we do next? Well, here are beach seeds on the ground. I've never crawled among beach seeds. It's time to do that. So we did that and it was very clear. Beach seeds is all about that. And then I got up and we went in the house and it was all about starting another book. And oh, I know what I'd do for that. And it was clear. And Chris, it wasn't any different than saving the worm, like writing another book or getting dinner ready or whatever. None, none of it is more important than any other thing. And the huge leap of faith we have to take is that if we let go with our minds, our souls can still steer. In fact, they're the ones steering. They're the ones that know how to deal with the transitions. So you go toward what you love. You go toward, it's like skiing a mogul. You get to the place where the, 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 you want to turn. Remember, it's all skiing is all about turning. It's one long controlled fall. And we tend to go in straight lines, but the way of the spiritual path goes in constant back and forth, this sort of sinuous turning shape. And you'll be pulled to one thing and then pulled to another. And if you don't think too hard in straight lines, you just flow with it. And it's, it's beautiful. And if there is no desire, take a nap. 
there's always something. So Kira says, the yard sale always seems to come right on the heels of my realizing and remarking, hey, I'm doing it. This is it. I am so with you. This is exactly what happens to me. And I think I grab hold with my mind, right? Like my mind is so used to being the thing I use that when I let go and it happens that like this incredible sense of being elevated and expanded happens, I'm like, I just did it. Bam. It's really, yeah, I'm with you. I'm used to it. Just wear a helmet. That's that's what I would, if you're, if you're really seeking enlightenment, wear a damn helmet because you're going to hit some rivers. Okay. <clears throat> By the way, I, I got inspired to buy a helmet literally right before I did that run where I ran into the river and it threw me into a tree and I would be dead if I hadn't been wearing a helmet. So somehow I knew to wear a helmet. Or once I had a helmet, I knew to run into a river. Um, Rhonda says, seems like transition is so much faster these days. Right? That's the thing. I used to be <clears throat> like... I don't know, you've probably heard me talk about how I was obsessed with, with tidal waves and rogue waves because I feel like, I felt like change was starting to come in, not like a nice little happy ocean tide, but like a tsunami carrying everything in its path and it will sweep you up. And if you try to fight it, you're dead. But if you can learn to play with the waves the way big time surfers do, it's a lot like skiing, then you can navigate it. Well, guess what? Now I don't even see it as a tsunami. The tsunami comes in, but then it goes out again. Then it comes in, then it goes out. But it does stop. Now, this is more like a dam has broken and a huge, massive tsunami river is just going to keep pouring us forward faster and faster into the changes that are happening. And things are getting more drastic. But please remember, as they get more drastically bad, they're getting more silently good. It's just that the as the as the light side rises, it gets more and more quiet. And as the dark side rises, it gets more and more shrill and loud. So the only thing we notice is the dark side rising, but the light side's moving just as fast. So it's a very exciting time to be alive. Wear a helmet. Okay, Lorraine says, how does one distinguish between being in the cloud of unknowing versus spiritual bypassing? What a great question. Yeah, spiritual bypassing is when you're like, uh, okay. So I've done a lot of crap stuff in my life to a lot of people. Uh, but you know what? Now I'm enlightened, so it's okay. The cloud of unknowing doesn't make you say to people, well, you see, I have gone beyond you into a place of no thought. So yes, child, learn from me. No, no. The cloud of unknowing is, I don't know, I, I'm really sorry I did bad things before. And I, uh, I'm not going to do them again, but... I'm still a really imperfect creature and I'm still like, I'm still capable of doing all kinds of things. I don't really know what I'm going to do, but I do know that I'm going to keep surrendering to love over and over. And I also know that I'm going to tell the truth. Now that's the one thing. That's why I wrote the book, The Way of Integrity, because I keep screwing up and I'm going to keep screwing up. And so like, maybe when you die, you don't, I don't know. But the fact is, if you screw up and then you, you catch it, and you go, oh, that was a moral and spiritual yard sale. And you don't deny it. And you don't um, try to get other people to ignore it. You just acknowledge the truth that you just had a yard sale. Then the yard sale, ironically enough, becomes a big part of your advancement toward enlightenment. Because you have to eat a lot of ego. You have to burn a lot of ego to say, yeah, I just, I was really doing quite well. Then I had a yard sale. Oops. So sorry. I did it right in public. <laughs> Not pretending I didn't. Um, please help me, anyone who knows better. And they will. And that's how we grow. And if you're if you're trying to be lofty, if you're trying to avoid the suffering, the I'm sorry, the look, oh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. That's the bypass. And you, that can be very dangerous. You don't want that. Teresa says, how does unknowing and healing from past trauma go together? That's so interesting because the not knowing of trauma of PTSD is suppression. And it feels, it feels terrible. Like, yes, you're kind of free of a trauma in the sense that you don't remember it or you've minimized the feeling. So you can remember it like a black and white movie with no feelings. And you're like, oh, thank God, I don't have to feel. Maybe you're drinking a little much because you don't want to feel or taking a few too many oxycodone or whatever it is. 
The difference between that and the cloud of unknowing is that the cloud of unknowing feels like absolute open freedom. It feels as if there is no matter there at all, where when you have repressed memories or repressed trauma, as I have had for whole decades of my life, there is a sense of being weighted down. That there's a sense of rot. There's a sense of, oh, there's something I have to deal with, but I don't know what it is. Trust me, it gets worse and worse and worse until you somehow get a break from it. And ultimately you find a safe space where the the emotion or the memory or whatever it is will break free. Then it goes on to this place of, oh, that I that then the cloud of forgetting comes up. And it's not that you don't know what happened. It's that you've healed so deeply from what happened that you never really need to look at it that closely again. You're just like, oh, I can use that to help myself understand people's suffering. And it was really useful to get me to a place where I was willing to give up everything I've known for the one to love the one thing I cannot think. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. And when you're in trauma, it feels like I'm trapped. I'm trapped. I'm trapped. So just know if it doesn't feel like freedom, it might, the, the unknowing is still a blessing often, but it's one that you have to get through in a different way. Wonderful question. Make sure you do it with a helmet and a specialist, like a therapist, because you don't want to go in there alone. So Jane says, how do you stay in the cloud of unknowing without popping back out? I have not solved this problem yet. I still have to pop that back out to do things. Um, what Adam says, if, sometimes I'll push him. I'll try to get him to remember something like, remember, we were like, we were at the ranch and you were saying this and doing that. And he says, now you're making my brain go backwards. And I think because he doesn't live with his brain remembering things all the time. And then he's, I say, okay, well, sorry to disturb. And he's like, it's okay. I have steam. Now steam, I don't know where he came up with this word. What I do know is that the word chi in Chinese or ki in Japanese, meaning the energy that flows through us and keeps us alive, life energy, and also the flow of the universe is literally means steam. And so Adam, what he, the way he lives and the way I kind of try to live too is when I get, when I start to cling to things that I remember or things that I'm prognosticating. So I'm caught between the past and the future, remorse and anxiety, remorse and anxiety, regret, anxiety. Like that's my brain going backwards. So what I need to do is go into a place of steam, which is the cloud, right? Interestingly enough, it's also a lot to do with breath. It's almost like you can breathe in the cloud of forgetting and the cloud of unknowing. Like you're outside on a, on a really foggy day and you can just bring them in and out. And it does a sense of sort of cleansing when you set yourself to climbing back up on the cloud of forgetting and bringing the cloud of unknowing down around you. Um, and then you'll pop back out again because that's the human condition. But you learn, again, I still fall down on a big mogul hill, but not nearly as often, right? The more practice you get, the, the more smoothly you ride. So Holly says, how do you know if your face plant and yard sale is a message from the universe or if it's just self-sabotage? What? It, I don't think it can be anything but a message from the universe because everything is feedback about how is is what I'm doing working right now? Huh. Okay. I was meditating. Everything seemed great. Then I had a yard sale. What happened? Oh, my doctor talked about my chubby foot. Okay. <laughs> um, message from the universe that it's okay to have a chubby foot. It's fine. I have a chubby purple foot. It's exactly what it's supposed to be. Now I'm back into the cloud of forgetting, the cloud of unknowing. It's always a message from the universe because the universe is built to give us feedback to say if we're on course or not. And if we're miserable, we're not on course. And if we're happy and, and deeply at peace and feeling free, we're on course. All right. Some of these are so tiny. Um, Surrender says, I'm an MBA grad on sabbatical from my not loved day job. I want to coach. I'm struggling to figure out how am I forcing it? I want it too much. Well, it sounds like you're coaching yourself. So I'd start with that. And then I'd get a few friends around who have some problems who've been face planning lately and say, can we talk about our lives? And don't try to teach coach. 
be there with people in the cloud of forgetting and the cloud of unknowing, because great coaching when you experience it, and I'm sure you have, is when something takes you out of the picture and the cloud of unknowing comes in and speaks to the other person about things that you may never think, you may never have thought before, but you feel the love caring for that person in a way that is not thinking. Okay, we're almost done. I have a couple more I want to get to. Uh, Mama Research just says, do you think the light and dark are both rising equally? No, I think that, um, I think they are in a certain sense, but I think that the darkness cannot win because light has a power to dispel darkness that darkness cannot equal for dispelling light. So if you bring a lighted candle into a dark room, you can see around you, but if you bring an unlighted candle into a bright room, it does not darken the room. And then the other thing is that duality exists within a field that is not duality, that is not matter, that is not substance. So my favorite way to put it is um, to quote Eckhart Tolle that life and death are not opposites. The opposite of death is birth and, the, and life is the field through which birth and death are moving. So I think the light and dark are, are rising um, equally. I think the darkness is not as strong as the light. And I think they both exist in a field of infinite love that nothing can ever touch or obliterate. Okay, so that's it for now, my darlings. Um, thank you so much for joining me just post yard sale, total psychological yard sale like yesterday. But I'm back in the cloud of forgetting, in the cloud of unknowing, and I'm so glad to know you. And um, though I will forget you once I get into my cloud of unknowing, I will always feel your love because I am willing to abandon everything I know to love the things I cannot think. I love you. Bye for now.